Today's date is September 24th, 2024. This is Luchana Spraker representing the City of Savannah's Municipal Archives. I am interviewing Mercedes Arnold Wright for the Savannah Community Memory Project, and we are conducting this interview at the Floyd Adams Jr. Administrative Building. Thank you for joining us today. You're welcome. So let's have, um, let's start by having you tell us your full name. Mercedes Anita Arnold Wright when I was married to my children's father. We are no longer married, so I no longer use Wright, but I'm known by Wright in Savannah because it was the name I used and uh, the name of my family when I was active in the Savannah Civil Rights Movement. Thank you for that clarification. When were you born? November 2nd, 1933. And where were you born? Washington, D.C. Um, so how did you get to Savannah? Through the tragic death of my mother and father. And I was brought to Savannah by my grandmother, Mrs. Maggie Robinson. What, say that last name again? R-O-B-E-R-T-S-O-N. Robinson. Um, so, um, do you want to tell us a little bit about your mother and father? How old were you when they passed? Four years old at the total death. My father passed uh, when I was about three and a half and from what I'm told, my mother died of heartbreak. She was totally dependent on him, as women were back in those days. And the pressure brought on a heart attack, the grief. Did you have siblings? I do not. Um, so you came to live with your grandmother. Where did, where did you live with her in Savannah? In Sackville on Waters Avenue. So, um, I'm familiar with Sackville. Tell me a little bit about what it was like growing up in Sackville. I will have to give you the memory of a four-year-old child. And I'm blessed to be lucid at this age to tell you the indelible imprint of what happened in Sackville. My grandmother and grandfather, he was Reverend uh, Deacon Q. S. Robinson. When my mother in Washington died, my, it was my grandmother's responsibility to come to Washington, D.C. to settle the estate. And my parents owned a four-story federal flat front, front home in Washington, D.C. Please note that this was 1938 and 37, sorry. And um, when she came to Washington to settle the estate and came back home, it was known that she had money from that endeavor as well as money of her own. They owned their home in Sackville. And I pass it now. It's the community where the Memorial Hospital is now located. I use that as a marker mm -hmm. because it's a general known uh, facility. And in December 1938, first I need to describe their home, and I'm glad
glad you're asking me that because this is one of my pursuits. I still have work to do, <laughs> though few years to do it. But nonetheless, um, I need to describe the home that I lived in when I came here. They owned a large two-story house and it was divided by a great hallway down the center with rooms on either side. I had a bedroom at the front of the house and my grandmother's bedroom was the next room on the right hand side of the house. And as I lay in bed one night, Back then, Savannians did not lock doors, believe it or not. And I heard a noise that I can't describe. And the next, it awakened me. And I tried to call her name. I called her mom. My mouth was moving, but God did not allow words to come out. The next thing I remember is two men standing at the open door of my bedroom. And one of them says, come on, she didn't hear anything. And they left the house. And the next morning, my grandmother was found with a sledgehammer in her head. Now, she served as a community, um, I should say lover, because they didn't call themselves leaders back then. If there was, and I'm learning this as I did family research as an adult. But if you needed, and she had a store to the side of the house, as I would describe it from my memory, it would have been the right side of the house if you were going south on Waters Avenue. And did the, the house uh, fronted Waters Avenue? It, it did. And, um, she had a store. I can remember the candy jars, the apples, the oranges, and I just roamed through it like a little piglet, eating and as children would do. And there was a huge tin container, a cabinet that sat on the legs with ice in it. Ice would be brought all day first and then the sodas would be brought, the Coca-Colas, and put in the ice, so that was the drink case. And there was sugar cane that stood in the corner. And there were canned goods and various things that the neighborhood would shop for and they need, would need. And as I can recall, she would give to those who could not pay and so she was considered an outstanding committee pers community person. But from that tragic accident, oh, and by the way, my grandfather died as well. But none the, and I can't speak about him or his death. I only remember the big lap that I was cuddled in of my grandmother. And there was uh, supposedly an investigation. And when I was 53 years old, I decided to begin and to complete my family history, which no one shared with children back then. They were a silent generation. They didn't talk about anything to you. They didn't tell you anything. You just had to figure it out for yourself whenever you became smart enough to do it. <clears throat> and 
um, I found that um, when they when they said just to come on in, in the family research later when I was 53 I found the article and it was in the, the Savannah Evening Press. Savannah had two newspapers, the Evening Press and the Savannah Morning News. Or maybe they didn't call it Morning, but it was two editions. And I found in there an article describing that the Negro grocery or whatever they call this store owner was murdered. I came to the department that you now head and I did research and I said I know where I will find it in the police department's records of that time period. Believe it or not, that is erased from your records. You will I, I can't give you precise dates later. I don't have my notes with me, but uh, nonetheless, um, mysteriously, that part of the police records are missing. The rumors floated around for two suspects. One was that she had had a confrontation over the accounting for the number of Coca-Colas that had put, been put in the little icebox container. And she challenged the figures of the Coca-Cola delivery people who were white males. And you just didn't do that in those days. The other uh, suspect mentioned was a person who was called her nephew, whose records I have not been able to trace. But for some, somehow he was related to her. And as I understand it, he was, he carried the Robertson name, Nathan, his first name was Nathan, but he carried the Robertson name. Seems like he was somehow related to my grandfather not necessarily by uh, genetics to her, but that he was jealous of my having come. So that's a part of my history uh, to which I have no answers. But from that point, I became fostered by a woman by the name of Georgia Armstrong Reed, another fiercely independent and open-spoken Negro woman. And I'm going to say Negro, since that's what we were called during those days. Nonetheless, she fostered me and laid the groundwork for my non-genetic being because from her, I learned to fight physically, legally, emotionally. There are no barriers and nothing that's honest and just and fair that I won't fight for. So I was reared by her and that is how I think, and I'll stop now because I, I don't think you, I don't know where you're going, but nonetheless, that is how I got to Maple Street School, which is what brings us together today. Well, I think all that background is important. I mean, those are major events in your life that shaped you. Where did um, Miss Reed live? Where did you go? 614 West Bolton Street. And so basically most of your formative years except for the very early ones you lived over on West Bolton Street with her? Absolutely. Okay. So um, tell us a little bit about that neighborhood and what it was like um, growing up in that neighborhood. I need to say one thing about sure. Sack, the Sackville home. If anyone is out there 
with a little round, approximately, my guess is four to five feet wide, children's dining room set with children's chairs that I sat my dollies and my little bears and whatever in as I serve tea. I have the tea set, but I don't have the table. But nonetheless, my grandmother's house was cleared and all of her furnishings went somewhere where I don't know. That sack bill. Okay, sorry, I'll get back to your question. <laughs> So, um, 614 West Bolton Street, what neighborhood is that considered? That is, um, uh, what can I call it? I'll call it in a second. Okay. Give me time. <laughs> <laughs> we'll get back the, to that, please. Yeah, that's mm -hmm. fine. Um, Curry Town. Curry Town. <laughs> okay, so tell us a little bit about Curry Town. Okay. Curry Town, Negro women that I knew in my, both of my mother's circles were either widowed and there were, there was one that was married who lived across the street, whose husband still lived, you know, they were either widowed, but nonetheless, they were fiercely independent people, most of them who owned their own properties and my mother's home on Bolton Street was a 10-room house that she had as a boarding house, the upstairs part of it. And whenever Negro entertainers came to town, they stayed there. They could not stay in hotels or any other public place that people stay. Jim Crow laws were fiercely, fiercely enabled and practiced in those days. Two such people come to mind. One is Cab Calloway, who was chased out of Tyvee and had to leave town, grab his things from our home, and leave by the light of the moon, as the old saying was, because for some reason the white women just be, became enamored with him when he performed the yada da da da, whatever that dance was that he did. And the white men chased him from Tybee and how he got back, quote, home to our house. I, I don't know that part of the story, but he did pack his things and left. The other group that some people will remember who stayed there was the Ink Spots. It was a group of black male entertainers. And I sat on the knee of Bill Kinney, who was their lead singer as he sang to me as a child. So those were the examples of some people who came. I inherited that house at her death, a long death, in which I was privileged to care for her. You, you did not carry your relatives to, quote, a home for old folks, as they called it then, and of course, for Negro families, that was a limited opportunity if the time came. So we took care of our own, which I proudly did while rearing my own family of which my Angelique is the baby and she sits there and I was happy to carry her. I had two sons and I love them beyond description, but I wanted me a girl. <laughs> <laughs> and I kept trying and she came and I had moved 
but I, I wasn't living in Mama's house then. I was in my own home, and I carried her to Mama's, well, as it turned out, deathbed, and said, oh, Mama, we've got our girl. Here she is. She was six weeks old, and she literally showed signs of life for the first time in weeks with a faint smile and a barely moving of her head. And soon she was gone, subsequent to that. Um, let me tell you, I'm, so I told you I went to Maple Street School. Yeah. So do you want me to go I, into Maple? Yeah, I wanna hear about Maple Street School. Remind me to tell you how Bolton Street played into my entrance into the civil rights movement. Okay, we are definitely going to get right. to that. Maple Street School was a huge wooden structure. I'm, I would imagine there's a picture of it somewhere mm -hmm. in Savannah's history. And of course, we had all black teachers, all Negro teachers. <laughs> really? You, you are whatever you want in front of you. <laughs> exactly. We can get to that part, too, because I choose to call myself that part of me that is black and most hated. I am a black woman, although I have, Af have African-American, I have Native American, Mexican-American, Anglo-American. But I am a black woman, so I, I choose that. All right. Um... Maple Street School had several people that gives me specific memories. My first grade teacher was Mrs. Hayes. Her first name escapes me because everybody was Mr. and Mrs. then, and you rarely knew their first names. I have it written somewhere in my research, but nonetheless. Let me talk about first grade. When I went to school, first of all, let me mention Mama's demeanor. This is Miss Georgia Reed. She was fiercely independent. She did not, quote, bite her tongue with anyone. And at that time, white merchants would come around the neighborhoods selling things. It might have been insurance, it might have been eggs, it might have been veggies or whatever. And one guy came up one day that had not been there before. And he knocked on the door and she came to me, hello, Annie, how are you today? And she said, um, what did you say? I said, Annie, how are you today? In his southern drawings, she says, Annie, I have two sisters and neither of them have children that look like you. You know, I mean, just putting him in his place. You don't name me, I name myself. And several things like this occurred. On the other hand, there was Mr. Slater, who lived in Pula. God forbid, nobody would believe what Pula looked like back then, nonetheless. Mr. Slater sold eggs, and he called her Miss Reed. Um, I have a deep affection for a Jewish grocery owner that served our neighborhood whom I love dearly. And she would allow me to skip to the corner to say, good morning, to Pap. His name was Maya Tenenbaum. And I'm doing a memoir in which I'm mentioning him and I'm 
pointing to the fact that Pap never smiled. And I did not know why until I did my, I started working with NAACP and learned things they don't teach you in school and you certainly were not going to learn them in, I don't know what your ancestors of that day learned in school, but I know what we didn't. And it was only doing NAACP work and the possibilities, but to put my finger on why Pat never smiled, he barely made it out of Poland. Okay, before Auschwitz and all. Okay. But nonetheless, he and my mother, Mrs. Reed, would feed whoever was hungry if you were on a class level that had you living in the lanes and you were cleaning the white folks' houses or you were doing whatever the menial work was. Okay, he did that. Let me get back to Mabel's tree. These are all good tangents. So I, don't just, worry about I just I just wander yeah. from place to place. But anyway, Mrs. Hayes, uh, my first grade teacher, first of all, Maple Street School was this huge, monstrous wooden structure. It was heated by great iron pot-bellied stoves with the pipes that went all the way up. And I can't imagine what time he came, but the janitor's name of my era was Mr. Taylor. Again, I don't know Mr. Taylor's name. I can see him as plain as I'm looking at you now would come in and stoke the stoves to have the rooms warm enough for us when we came in in winter. And the pot-bellied stove would get real hot in the back and the heat would gradually move to the front. So whether you were warm or too warm, are comfortable depending on where you sat and the, the way that heat circulated from that pot-bellied wooden stove that you knew not to touch or go near. We went to a lunch room for lunch and every day the menu never changed. There was a big, thick, white bowl of vegetable soup. I can taste it now, great tasting soup. You got this and a piece of usually wheat bread for five cents. And one day, and this is gonna venture off into another part, <laughs> but nonetheless, one day my nickel went missing. And Mrs. Hayes said to me, why didn't, why did you come back? Did you eat in your lunch? What? And I said, I didn't have none. I told that I didn't have the nickel. So she gave me two grapes two green, white grapes. So when I went home and I told Mama I lost my nickel, well, you have not eaten all day long. You didn't have any food. And I said, oh yes, Miss Hayes gave me something to eat. What did she give you? I said, she gave me two grapes. Two grapes? <laughs> Boom, 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 <laughs> off to the school she went and gave Miss Hayes. Holy hell, <laughs> for those two grapes, I was so sorry, but I said it. But nonetheless, that, that happened. Was the lunchroom in a separate building from the main building? I think it was. I believe we had to go outside to get to the lunchroom. I think. 
If not, it was on the first floor. No, no, yes, I think it was. What about the um, bathrooms? The bathrooms too. I, please don't don't push me on that. I'm not. I can't remember <laughs> that. Okay. Okay. Um, that was one incident. Then we had the color thing that exists today that's the result of slavery. Everything white or light was right and bright and the best thing that could ever happen to you. So there came a division in, within the race that exists today. Um, and I was dressed every day, a dress that had been, there were no synthetics back then, it was all cotton. So mama had a housekeeper that did the washing and the ironing and the, making certain the dresses stood out and my bow had to be tied in the back and the ribbon had to match and the socks and the shoes. And the other children were poor. They didn't have these kinds of things. So in addition to my, as it turns out, later being called, they were too little then to know this term, the buckra's child. My hair was down here and, and I looked white. So, and now they got that term from where? Home. They heard the parents talking about this little buckra's child. And, she has no parents and she it just went on and on and on and there was another girl who whose complexion befell her she did not have the long hair but she too was light she lived on minus and west broad street which meant that she headed in a different direction that i did i had to come south to Gwinnett to come home and she went north up to get to Minor Street. So the African complexion children would divide up and beat Talitha up on her way home and they'd head home, head south to beat me, which they did until my mother, Georgia Reed, said to me, and I don't know what's allowed, and I won't say it. You can say whatever you want. But she told me, if I came home one more time with my clothes all wrinkled, my bows gone, and my hair unbraided, and had been beaten by somebody and didn't fight back that I had better give my heart to God because my ass was going to belong to her. And it did, so I had to make my choice. And I had a little cousin, Willie James, who also, whose complexion also befell him. And he started going to Maple Street School and I had to fight for him. So I would take off my Oxford shoes, which I got at Belt's department store, and I look at that tiled entrance way to Belt's right now. Well, I haven't been there this time. I hope it's still there, where I had to go to get my shoes, where she had to go to get my shoes because I had extremely narrow feet, and I wore five and six A very narrow shoes. But I would take those Oxfords off, and I whip them to no end and they stopped fighting me. So I learned in life, you gotta fight back. If you don't fight back, they'll run over you. Did you find it easier and to fight for him than to fight for yourself? Oh time? no, I began fighting for everybody because I knew what I was gonna get when I got home. Oh, you didn't <laughs> want that. I'm not gonna talk about that. Anyway, then, um, let me just talk briefly about the second grade teacher and the principal. Two things stick out in my mind. This is at <clears throat> Maple Street School. There was a second grade teacher whose name was Mrs. Broughton. 
And there was a boy in our class whose name was Leroy. Now, were I to describe what I know as a great-grandmother now, Leroy had some sort of deficiency. I, I, I never heard of uh, the names of the deficiencies until recent history. But he couldn't keep still. He was from one piece of devil meant to the other. Off he went. And Mrs. Broughton was a heavy set woman with very large arms and the fat hung over the elbow. They were so large. And Leroy did something that annoyed her one day and she couldn't stop because he couldn't stop. You know, I don't know whether it was autism, whether it was, what it was. They didn't know back then for anybody's kids, I don't think, except the super wealthy. But nonetheless, she hauled off and slapped this child in the face so hard until blood gushed from his nose. Now, she would be in jail if that happened. But that sticks out in my memory as how you were raised by, and they beat you for everything. They just did. Um, so there's Mrs. Hayes and Grace Miss Broughton and the slapping, and I cried for Leroy. I, I always had empathy. If, if you're in trouble or you're hurting or something, I don't care, you black, white, polka dot, whatever, I'm going to fight for you. <laughs> it's just in me. And uh, so I remembered Mr. Taylor, my Ms. Hayes, Grapes, Ms. Broughton, Talitha, and having to fight your way home. What else do you want to know? <laughs> Um, am I going to? Am I telling you, you too much? You were doing great. You were doing great. Okay. Um, so Maple Street School went up through what grade when you were there? When I was there, it went up to sixth grade, but I did not stay. I was taken out of Maple and put into the Florence Street School. Okay. Why? I'm not certain. As a matter of fact, for one year, I was sent to St. Mary's Catholic School. And then by the next year, I guess Mama wasn't pleased with that or whatever, I went to Florence Street School. And Mrs. Emma Quinney was the principal there, but your focus is far is uh, Our focus is you, so oh. <laughs> whatever you want to talk about. Okay, well, um, back then our teachers dressed They would call it appropriately, but you had three types of clothes. I had to change clothes three times a day. I had my school clothes. I had sun suits in the summer for playtime. And then, you know, I had to have a bath before bed. All of those things just fell into place. And the lady who came to help at the house washed and did the clothes and so forth. Um, Mrs. Lula Allen on Bolton Street and Mrs. Pendavis on Gwinnett Street made all of my dresses and those that were, were made, the, the materials had to come from, uh, they had to be pongee silk for my church clothes and yada da yada da, okay, anyway. Um, but I went to Florence and there was Mrs. Mrs. Emma Quinney, Q-U-I-N-N-E-Y, who was the principal, a very dignified, well-dressed, of course, woman. And they taught us posture then. You did not, if you sit correctly, straighten your back. So we all learned to see, you didn't chew gum, and oh my God, that was the biggest crime in school if you were caught with gum in your mouth. I mean, things that are happening in school nowadays that she's in education, she tells me about. Uh. <laughs> but anyway, um, 
So I went to Florence. There was Miss Emma Quinney, and and there was Miss Esther Warwick. And I, these are two teachers. She was the principal, Miss Quinney. The one teacher that stood out with me at Florence was Mrs. Esther Warwick. Two things made me stand out with her. One was that she had a son and a daughter whom I've never met, Jean and John Warwick. She adored those children. And in as much as I got all of the material things, needed and unneeded from Mama, she was not a warm person, so I did not get any hugs, any loves, any cuddles, any, oh, is that hurting you? Oh, baby, baby, like we do our kids. Oh, no, 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 no. You had to be ready to, for war. <laughs> and I think she was right, but at that time, it not, did not serve me well emotionally as a child, and I had to find love through my own family and my three children. But uh, Miss, Miss Warwick stands out because of her love for her two children, whom she always talked about to us, and j several things, but one other thing that made sense to me when I became involved with NAACP. We would have poetry day. We would recite poems. We had to know uh, whatever, all of them. But anyway, and we could have an entertainment day and we could sing songs. And one day, <coughs> well, we had a boy in our class who was taller than anyone else, Ellis Trapio. But anyway, he, he couldn't help it, he didn't know. So when it was Alice's time to sing this particular uh, day of entertainment, whatever they called it, Alice stood up his full height, I think it uh, must have been about six, six feet tall then. He was just a big kid. And he got up, look away, look away, Dixieland, I wish I was in Dixie. Hoorah, hoorah, Ms. Warwick says. Ellis, don't you know another song? I um, no, no ma'am, well that scared him after that. I'm gonna teach you one. And, and Ellis shrank to about two feet, embarrassed to the hilt she stopped the singing of Dixie. And none of us knew why. We thought that sounded good. In fact, when it came on as the, the uh, radio sign-in song every morning, uh, we sang it. We were all delighted. So Ellis just was reduced to two feet tall. She says, I'm going to teach the class another song. And that other song was, and I'm doing a blank. Did you add, you edit this and cut out some? Please, please, please. I, I'll sing it in a minute. It, it just went away. Uh, it'll come back. But nonetheless, she did, yeah. And when that song comes to me, I'm gonna break in and tell you. That's exactly how we want it. Um, where did you go to school after Florence? After Florence, I went to Alfred E. Beach High School, boarded by Henry and Anderson and Kyla and Burroughs Street in what is now the Midtown area. Um, you, you've, taught, you've mentioned several times your involvement with NAACP. Mm -hmm. How did you get involved? You, there's lots of leaders in your youth that are leading you to this path, but when did you actually start going to meetings, getting involved? On Bolton Street, by 1960, I had my two sons, 
and I was coming back and forth from my home to take care of Mama, who by then grew with diabetes and different ailments. And she had one eye removed. She, it was really bad. I was looking after my home and hers. And on Bolton Street, there was a family, the Branch family, B-R-A-N-C-H. This was Mrs. Sadie Branch, who raised her two granddaughters, Margie and Edna. And I am 10 years older, 10 and a half, 11 years older than Edna. And Margie, I think must have been maybe two or three years older than Edna. And we were like family. We were just very close. And Margie went to a meeting one day in the afternoon that wandered all into early evening not yet dark but she was not at home and the rule back then was that you had to be in the house before dark even if you were playing outside or if perchance you had been allowed to have, say it was Saturday and you had a dime and you could go to the Star Theater and see a movie and popcorn and see the cowboys beat up the Indians and whatever you had to be home before dark Marjorie was not at home, and Edna came running to me. Nurse, nurse, we got to do something. We got to do something. I said, what's the matter? Come, come, let me tell you. Big secret. Margie had gone to some secret meeting, and she was not home yet. The meeting was held at the Bolton Street Baptist Church of the NAACP Youth Council, the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People's Youth Council. We got to do something. Mama's going to kill her if she isn't home. And I said, well, where is she? I don't know, except she went to some NAACP meeting. And I said, okay, okay, don't worry. I'll go to see where she is. Well, sure enough, it was March 16th, 1960. The students had gone to sit in and some had gone to jail, but thank God Margie was doing some of the clerical work and was at the church. I said, oh, you have got to come. You got to go home. So sure enough, Margie goes home. And of course, I wanted to know what was this all about? Now, I, we knew Mr. Law. You did not, did not do anything if you were a self-respecting, decent Negro, if you did not give him your 50 cents or your NAACP membership. So as adults, my husband and I gave him the 50 cents. Otherwise, you had to peel off the porch or the corner or wherever if you saw him coming because he was going to take you apart. So, okay, what is this meeting about? Well, when I get there, the kids, Marty comes home and all that's resolved, but then I'm listening to what the meeting is about and Mr. Law says, oh, you came. I'm so glad you're here. And you... What are you going to do? What committee are you going to do? And I said, well, I don't know what committee. What do I know? And that's how I got into NAACP. And Hosea Williams, of whom I hear nothing. I don't know if Savannah has anything named for Hosea. I don't know. A fighter. Half crazy. But, I mean, listen, on the race question, he would and he was, he, he was a bundle of hilarity. 
and at that time, he was going to head the boycott committee. And Wesley says, you need a co-chair because you're running all over the place. He and Wesley stayed at it, okay, these two men. You are gonna, you need a co-chair and you are, you're running all over the place and meeting yourself, him and that, you don't know what you're doing half the time, blah, blah, blah. Mercedes, why don't you be the chair of this committee? I said, well, Mr. Lord, listen, I'm totally dumbfounded, but nonetheless, that's how I came in. Then I became the referee between Mr. Law and Hosea Williams. And Hosea would lay me out. Yes, all you do is follow everything that law says. Anything he says is the law. I said, yes, it is the law because he's a sensible man. NAACP has rules and regulations. And no, Mr. Wilkins, as I get on into it, does not want our students in jail. He wants them in school. And so Hosea runs off the SELC because it's not as organized. And he can do whatever he wants over there, but he couldn't with him. That's what that fuss was all about. Then came the crusade for voters. Well, we were already registering people to vote. And, and I learned from Esther. I don't know where Esther's secretarial records are. No one has found them. And there are pictures galore that Willie Chisholm came every Sunday to the mass meetings, which followed all of this that I'm telling you about probably going too far, too long, so I need to stop. Anyway, yeah. <laughs> um, so. Mine eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. <laughs> there you go. That's my that. song. Please edit and put that in there. When Ms. Warwick sat uh, Ellis down, and she said, don't, you can't, we, we've got another song. Then she taught us, mine eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. And we sang that song with such pride. And then it was learned and explained and an ACP made sense, you know. Okay, all right, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no, this is all great. Um, there's a couple things I wanted to ask you about your work in the NAACP from some photos we have from Mr. Law's collection. Okay. So um, this is a photo, I'll hand it to you from the Wadens. <laughs> so tell us about your involvement in the Wadens at Tybee, what they were for people who don't know. Well, um, the adversaries of civil rights and human rights for all people all people, which NAACP promoted, and which is why that organization means so much to me. These adversaries decided that not only did they own the stores and the hotels and the buses and the trains and everything else on earth, but they owned the Atlantic Ocean, 18 miles from the city of Savannah. And we could not go to the beach. We had to pack our little children and go to Jacksonville to quote the colored beach down there to get to a beach or the ocean. And so it was decided that this brave group of children, not me now, and not Hosea. We were the adult advisors to these kids saying what we're getting into in Taipei would have one road, one way in, one way out. And I was put in charge of the press because the press was alerted that it was going to happen and I interacted with the national media, one of whom I really had close contact contact with was Dick Valeriani of NBC News. And, but this group, we would train and tell them what was going on. And we first said, you stay on the beach. We didn't want them in the water 
where somebody could go and hold them down. We, they were given instructions, and basically that's what Hosea and I did, and I think that's E.J. Josie. Have you heard his name before? Yes. Delightful man. I mean, really stood out. Most professionals in the Negro community were afraid to step out. But, and he was the chief librarian at Savannah State College. But, you know, he said, to heck with that. And off he came with us and the children. So that's E.J. Josie. And these brave souls here, and I'm sure some of them without their parents' consent, wanted to go and they went and thank God nobody dragged them in the water and what they did after they got down there and they they had been taught you know how to behave what to say so forth and so on and this is one group and this is not all of them because I think the next group Edna was in and some other people so do you remember who excuse me yes, may I say one sure. thing um, not this picture but Another one is at in front of the Tybee Historical Society. It is in terrible shape. So I'm going to start some fundraiser of some sort. A part of what I'm going to do next is to see can we get that refurbished mm -hmm. and put in some decent form. But anyway, okay, sorry. Okay. Um, I was curious who came up with the idea of doing wait-ins at Tybee. Do you know who first thought about it? It wasn't Mr. Long and it wasn't Hosea and I can't remember who I think it was James Brown, one of the you one of the kids from the Savannah State chapter uh, out at the college, I think. Okay. Please don't well, quote. I just don't know. I was just curious mm -hmm. if that was mm -hmm. um, but we had uh, Neil ends at the churches. We had to call into account. You're coming here saying you are children of God and Jesus this and Jesus that. And we can't kneel and sit beside you on Sunday. So we did that too. Mm -hmm. Now, to go back to remember whose idea it was first, I can't, I know it wasn't mine. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. So another picture I wanted to show you. This is. Excuse me. Excuse me. I just need to see. I can't count for all of these, but Edna and I are always amazed at how many of these kids are no longer with us. They are deceased, you know? And Ben Clark started out with us. He eventually, when the break came between NAACP and the Crusade for Voters, he went over with Hosea, which was fine, but you know. Um, but most of these kids are deceased Oh, I see, is she on here? And I can't ever call her name. I know that she's just, anyway, I won't go with them. But there's a, a young woman who's the, you will. So I wanted to ask you about this other photo to talk a little bit about it. So this also came from Mr. Laws and mm -hmm. Double ACP Records, mm -hmm. and it was labeled Education Committee mm -hmm. before they went to Federal District Court in Brunswick. That's correct. So. Could you tell us a little bit about the Education Committee and, and what they were, what they did, what's, what's going on here? Of course I can. <clears throat> um, May 17, 1964, I'm sure you know about, and, and the, the sec sec Supreme Court's decision regarding the desegregation of schools had been won by the NAACP Legal Defense and Education Fund at the time headed by Thurgood Marshall, Mr. Justice Marshall, the first to the Supreme Court. Um, and each branch had several committees. It has, the, each branch has the Political Action Committee, which means voter registration only no endorsement of candidates. That was circumvented by the organization of the political advisory council where you could be a member of every community. You didn't have to be a member of NAACP, but you brought 
the each candidate running for any office in your local community was invited to come up and questions were raised by the audience. What are you going to do about this? Are you going to pave the streets? Are you going to repair the sewers or whatever? It was interaction between the voters and the candidate for whatever office that usually it was he, I started to say he or she was running for, but it was always guys mainly. But anyway, let's get back to the education committee. So here sits my mentor, Constance Baker Motley, judge of the Southern District Court of New York, appointed by Lyndon Baines Johnson, and I was at her house visiting with her as she did visit me when she came to Savannah. Uh, when I went to Peace Corps, I was called at her, and my daughter, I think, referred her to the number where I was anyway. So she and I uh, became great friends. This is Bobby Mayfield, who was um, part of the legal team. Uh, this is another NAACP lawyer who worked with uh, Mrs. Motley, Derek Bell, and the two of them also, well, I interacted more with Derek in Jackson, Mississippi when I was assigned to assist Medgar Evans. And this is Mrs. Uh, this is Carolyn Coleman's mother. You've heard of Carolyn Coleman, I'm sure. And this is Mr. Sam Brown. Back then, the black community knew everybody. We all knew each other. He was our Bolton Street postman for forever until the route was taken over by a younger postman who played a real role in my life, Ben Lewis. But we, we knew everybody. Anyway, that's Carolyn Coleman's mother, who was a part of the breakup and went over to the NAACP. This is Merle Anfield who was a part of the boycott committee, who traveled with us, and who was with me and Hosea and several other people, none of whom are here. But Merrill was, and I was, when we desegregated the Nancy Hanks. The train would run between Savannah and Atlanta. <coughs> and uh, Negroes had a special car by the engine, and we refused to go to the engine. And let's get back to the color thing for the little fun. Hosea stood behind me, and I was the first to enter the train car with the conductor standing on the ground accepting the tickets. And when I got there, he accepted my ticket, and I walked in and went the opposite direction to quote the white coach and sat myself down. And when they got to Jose, he says, you know, niggers can't come in here. Nigger, you, you go left. He said, no, I don't want to go left. This is Jose telling her, no, I want to go where she went. I want to sit up there. You can't go up there. Niggers are not allowed up. He said, well, you just let one up there. <laughs> so crazy. Just insane. Then he and a, a white guy it was a comedy show you could have sold tickets to all the way back on the Nancy Hanks, talking about each other. It was absolutely insane. If it, there had been a recording, you could send my, both of them were crazy. What year was this ha happening? It had to be 62, I think. Please research any of these, I can't. That's why I'm asking. Uh-huh, I think it was around 62. Okay. Could have been 61, 62. Okay. And then you had, all of these people were actives. Uh, there's Dr. Jameson, J.W. Jameson. Uh, this lady, there needs to be a statue in her honor. That's Miss Virginia Mack. She, 
Now we have left the school and we're talking about this picture. Okay. <laughs> I told you how I got to NHB. Okay, so this is Miss Virginia Mack. When we picketed City Hall because we couldn't have a hearing at City Hall with elected officials, W. Lee Mingledorf was the mayor. He promptly called the police. I think it was Sidney Barnes that we had mm -hmm. as the police chief and had all of every, the kids arrest, arrested. And to circumvent that until the lawyers could get through the courts with it, with the challenge, I called the Committee of Women and established the Telephone Committee to keep the boycott going was important because nothing meant anything to any white official in Savannah or store owner except the ballot and the buck. Mm -hmm. And we learned that and we used it and we had to organize to circumvent the arrests that were being made and so we went to the telephone. So I have I'm not going to give it to you. It's going to Barnett for the museum. I have restored a hurriedly put together telephone directory of all of the black Negro residents of Savannah of that day and their phone numbers. Mm -hmm. And this woman was my telephone committee chairman. And uh, as the chairperson, I could count on Miss Virginia Mack. She's deceased. Um, I stood by her deathbed and thanked her. And well, there I am at the back there. I didn't realize, yes, that's me. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Dr. Jameson. So, yes, these were the people, and there's Mr. Garrison and Esther, Reverend Stell. All of these people need monuments somewhere, mm -hmm. them. You know, they were the older ones. I was a newcomer to be. They had been at it for a minute. But this dear lady, Miss Virginia Mack, I'll never forget her. Anyway. Yeah. Can I ask you a question about City Hall, since mm -hmm. you mentioned it? Um, we had a gentleman in once doing research, and he said that the city, you know, the city treasurer's office was on the first floor where you would come to pay your bills. And he said that they would come up to the window and pay at the window without coming inside the building. Do you remember that? I have to remember it because my business skills came through my foster mother, Ms. Georgia Reed. She owned her home, as I told you, which was the boarding house and rental property. My mother, grandmother, who was murdered, owned her little houses over in Sackville where she collected rent. So I came in that uh, environment, came up in that environment, and I was sent to pay the electric bill, the water bill, and the taxes. All of these bills were separated for me ever since I was about seven years old. And I had to go and this, 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 that, that. And you had windows that were separated. And yes, you couldn't go, you know. Edna sitting up in there as the mayor. Floyd, <laughs> little Floyd, whose father ran the, the tribute, the, the paper, not the tribune, the herald. Press boy, he was called. Um, Otis, who we had to fight. To, that's another story you need to hear, and how Otis got into Armstrong Junior College that was on um, mm -hmm. Gaston and Rick. Yes. Okay. Well, well, thank you because we we have not been able to find somebody who could confirm that. So. Yes. Yes. Um, you and you would have been hard pressed to find women in leadership roles. They were quote secretaries. That's all you guys could do, mm -hmm. not us. Yeah. Um, so the last 
question really I wanted to ask you about NAACP is you went on to become a field director for the NAACP Southeast Region. Can you tell us about the work you did in that position? I did not become field director in the Southeast Region. I became field director at large to go and assist Medgar Evers in Jackson, Mississippi, which is how I got there. And I would go wherever I was needed to help them uh, bolster their voter registration and selective buying efforts. Mm -hmm. um, so I notice you have some pins on, including one, Shirley Chisholm for president. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Tell us a little bit about your involvement in her uh, presidential campaign. This dear woman in 1972 decided that she would run for president of the United States of America. And all of the men thought she had truly lost her mind. That was number one. Because she was a woman and a Negro woman and African black and there was one part of their reasoning that was rational. It was that were we to embrace her movement, it would split the vote and damage Hubert, I mean, uh, McGovern, okay? And so politically you could go with that, but most of it was because she was a woman. There's another woman here in Savannah whom they fought tooth and nail and did not want her to run for anything, but they would, quote, appoint her to a committee. This committee or that committee, but never to run for office. And she called me and she said, Mary, I'm going to run for whatever it was she was running for at that time. She ran a couple of times. And I supported her and fought for her, and that was Miriam Center. You know, we just had to fight that. It was always a level of you can't, you mustn't, you shouldn't, you ain't, you won't, don't. And so, yes, I headed the Shirley Chisholm campaign of 1972, fought all the men about it, and Miriam helped. And this is why I can support Kamala now. She paved the way for this one to win today. When we fight, we win. You guys can't say anything about that, but I can. I want guns regulated, and I want the government to stay out of our bodies. What advice would you give to young people or young girls, young women that are fighting injustices that they see today? Be careful of the man you choose as a mate. Find out where he is on your issue as a woman. Be careful. They will hold you back because they have been taught that they are intellectually mentally, physically superior to you. It's to a point not their fault because they have been taught that. It is biblically mandated. You are their servants. So you have to determine whether you are a servant or whether you are a free human being to make your choices. Just be careful. That's all. So those are all of the questions I had for you. Is there anything else you want to share about Savannah, uh, growing up here, your experiences during the civil rights movement, what anything after later in life, any, anything that we haven't touched on that you think we need to know about or talk about? I want everyone to 
understand the importance of the battles that we have had to fight and the obstacles that we have had to overcome. The barriers are still there. They are camouflaged in many ways, but they're there. Know them when you see them. Follow your mind. There's something called a woman's tuition that's true. It's real. It's there. Pay attention to it. Don't let anyone tell you you can't, you won't, you shouldn't, you mustn't. Whatever it is that's positive, that's going to be uplifting to you, your families, your children, your community, you're supposed to leave this word. This is my philosophy. I'm supposed to leave it better than I found it. The segregated savanna that I found is not what I left. When I open the New York Times today, and all I can see is how bright and brilliant and wonderful and the best place to retire and raise a family and yada da yada Savannah is. And I said, yes, it's because of Wesley Wallace Law and Hosea Williams and Esther Garrison and the NAACP and whoever. And let me tell you something. We did not do this by ourselves. Do you, do you understand me? When NAACP fought these battles in Savannah, that little man, Wesley Wallace Law, did not allow anyone to call somebody a cracker or to be nasty to people because of the color of their skin. You know, NAACP said, if that's how you are, then you are like them. There's no difference. So if you are mimicking your enemy's practice and pattern, you know, we didn't use those words, but you know what he was saying, judge people as they are. How do they treat you? Let me use one example. Otis Johnson went to, I believe it was the Navy, or military somewhere, came back, and wanted to go to Armstrong Junior College. Those people threw up every barrier they could possibly find when he came and went to register. Uh, you didn't do this, you haven't done it, you blah, blah, blah. He satisfied whatever their queries were. Otis can tell you, he dealt with it in his book. The final thing they did was say, you have to be sponsored by an ally. You have to have had a relative or a friend who is an Armstrong ally. <laughs> really? Who? We sat in, I was on an ACP board at the time. Reverend L. Scott Stell, who is also on that picture, was chair of the Education Committee. Reverend P. A. Patterson was, at that time, I think either co-chair or they shared the chair, but nonetheless, he was very active, intimately with the branch and its work. Sat in a meeting board meeting. And there, by that time, I think it was two or three in the morning, but about 1.30 or two, Wesley said, I called him Mr. Law in formal positions, but we called each other. He called me Mercer and I called him Wesley. Wesley said, wait a minute. I got an idea. We got a friend. He picked up the phone and he called Mason Gordon Roberts, and I want you to remember this name. He was a physician in Savannah. 
and he told Mason what the problem was. He was asleep, of course, because by then it's about 1.32, and then Mason said, Get in, come on. Yes, I, of course I'll do it. Yes, 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 how stupid, whatever. He welcomed the opportunity. Wesley, Reverend Patterson, and Reverend Stell got in the car. It was about two or three in the morning. Am I going? To no, you're fine. Oh, okay. In the car and went to Mary and Mason Gordon's house, and Mason signed as his sponsor, as Otis's sponsor. They was, there was nothing else that they could throw up and say. And that's how Otis went there and from on. Okay, that's the history of how he got in. Now, let me talk about some other friends. Okay. All right. My children's father, Daniel W. Wright Jr., was a well-loved counselor in the public school system here. After desegregation, you had to talk about the desegregation of faculty. He was over at Deach High School. And the integration of faculty needed to take place and he volunteered to go to Savannah High School. The principal there at the time was as nasty as he could possibly be. And Dan would come home and say, and I said, no, well, we're not going to stand for that. And I went back to Wesley and I said, Wesley, we've got to do something. And I told him what this principal was doing to the black teachers. And I said, well, he said, no problem, we got it. And you know who stood up and said, uh-uh and went over there and said, now you are going to stop that. Stop treating these people like that, okay? It was a Jewish woman, a Jewish woman by the name of Gertrude Javits. We could always count on her. And the topic, as you may refer to this when you get to it, was we didn't do it by ourselves, okay? And Mrs. Javits, all she had to do was call Frank Spencer and his wife, and and she was on the board. Uh, her name she is. Yeah, so, Frank's Captain Frank Spencer's wife. Yeah, that's <laughs> fine. We'll look her up. It's exploding, but it, it'll come back. I'll get it out. But anyway, yes. So now, okay. I started to talk about the children's father, Daniel W. Wright III, who fought his way in through Savannah High School and all of that. But how did he get his education? He was a Korean War veteran. And thankfully, because I thought I would just die and fall off the earth when his draft number came up and he got the letter to report for duty at Fort Jackson, South Carolina, and I was pregnant with our first child and I thought the world had come to an end. But when he returned, and as thousands of other veterans did, take advantage of the GI Bill for education, he could not attend Georgia State University for the education in the field that he wanted. So the U.S. government and the taxpayers of Georgia had to pay his tuition to NYU in New York. You know, I, it's so nonsensical. So we drive babies' diapers outside of the car with all of the, the chicken and cake and cookies and donuts and sodas and juice and whatever and milk bottles that we could to go up and down the road, up and down the road to New York for him to get an education as a veteran. I think yeah. you used the right word when you said nonsensical. Yes, yes. yes. And 
uh, but I was, okay, so I got to that point to say, to continue with, we didn't do it by ourselves. While he's in New York at one point, we would stay with Nana, his mother, when we were there, and it was sort of a vacation for me and the children. But while he was in New York, I said to him, I said to myself first, as I recruited Negro children to desegregate the public schools, wait a minute, what about the Catholic schools where we're going bowing and scraping to mass and all of the NYC, the, the youth, you know, training children to be great Christians in the Catholic church and all of this nonsense. And they can't even come to school. What? So, no, we got to go there. So I called him and I said, I explained to him just as he said, well, I'm not there to do it. And I said, Hosea will do it. Jose and I march out to St. James Catholic School one Sunday after church because we didn't want them to be able to hide. And as the church turned out, the mass ended and the rector was shaking hands and everything at the door. Jose and I marched up and I told them I wanted to register my three children. She was in kindergarten, Ruth was in second grade, Danny was in third. And we expected hell to break loose. The hand went out and I was welcomed. We were welcomed. Jose says, I'm not their father, but I'm standing in for their father. And it was Monsignor John Toomey. These are just a few of the names that I'm giving to you. There weren't that many, but these stood out significantly. And he welcomed us to the church, and I'm told by some of the members who befriended us that there were at least six moneyed family who supported the church financially, who left and said before they would sit and allow us to come. <laughs> whatever and long story short within near his his utmost senior years he was transferred by the bishop here who was a racist and I have another experience with him that lets me know but nonetheless uh, he was transferred to an inner city threatening community type parish in Macon, Georgia, and that's where he died. So, but Monsignor Toomey, he's in the museum, you know, I insisted he has to be, he stood with us all the way, he was on the mayor's committee to desegregate the city along with others, you know. Uh, Could I ask you, since you mentioned the mayor, you talked about Mingledorf a little bit, did you have interaction with Malcolm McLean? Listen, we no, no, we didn't have interaction. We put together our votes from our red, voter registration effort along with the votes of right thinking and decent people from the Jewish and white community in Savannah. We could always count on approximately 3,000 votes to go over the hill and we elected Malcolm McLean. And Malcolm McLean and Leo Center and that aldermanic group changed the city. And that plaque that they have out by his street ought to be downtown on Broughton Street. And why it's not there, I don't know. I'm probably gonna call somebody and say either go and get it or make another one or do something. He was a kind and decent man who put this city along with our efforts in the New York Times today as the city to raise a family, a city to retire in the most beautiful city in the world. Somebody said it was a beautiful city with a dirty face way back when, but yes, yes. So we had help 
we, we Aaron Bushbaum joined uh, Attorney Gadsden and the NAACP lawyers. Uh, the president of Savannah Bank and Trust Company. Oh, gosh, when will his name come to me? May I send it to you? Of course. <laughs> okay. Yes, but there were decent people who stood up when it was not popular. When, when we probably wouldn't have been paid any attention, you know, to say this is wrong, you can't do this to these people, they are citizens. They are us, we are them. This has been a fascinating conversation. <laughs> um, do you have a closing thought you want to share? Please, Savannah, go forward. Don't go back. Please. Well, thank you, Ms. Arnold, for sharing your story with us today.